So, our speaker is Professor Krista Thomason. Um, she is an assistant professor of philosophy at Swarthmore College, um, who specializes in moral psychology with a focus on moral emotions, Kant's moral theory, and issues in human rights. Um, her work appears in journals like Philosophy and Phenomenological Research, Ethical Theory and Moral Practice, and Kantian Review. And her first book, entitled Naked, The Dark Side of Shame and Moral Life, is coming out in February with Oxford University Press. So um, tonight, she is going to speak to us about, a, present to us, indeed, a Kantian argument against solitary confinement. I would like you all to help me welcome Professor Krista Thomas. Thank you. I'm going to start my timer so that I keep myself honest here. Um, so thank you very much to Ed. Thank you very much to everybody in the department and everybody involved in theorizing at Rowan. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really happy to be invited. Um, I hope you will uh, enjoy the talk. We'll see how it goes. So again, the title of my talk, um, A Kantian Argument Against Solitary Confinement. So the very first thing that I want to do before we kind of dive into the Kant stuff, and I'm going to promise to try to make that as easy as possible. Um, I don't know if I, I'm going to live through that promise, but we'll see. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to do is give you a little bit of background on sort of the supermax prison. I'm going to focus mainly on the US uh, solitary confinement, sort of issues surrounding the Eighth Amendment, because that's really, I think, uh, going to give you a little bit of a sense of the state of the literature. So what I've got here is uh, a photo, an aerial photo of uh, a supermax prison. So this is Pelican Bay. It's a supermax prison that's in California. And one of the first things to note about supermax prisons, so they, the supermax stands for, uh, short for supermaximum security. Uh, one of the things that we know is that we have trouble collecting information about supermax prisons. So uh, they vary a great deal from state to state. They are called different things in different states, and sometimes they are organized a little bit differently, so um, not all supermax prisons are exactly the same, so it's a little bit difficult to get a kind of common sense of what supermax prisons are, but those are the type of prisons where you will typically find in the US today solitary confinement cells. So in Pelican Bay, for example, there are actually two different portions. So this sort of wing-looking portion here is the kind of general population section of the prison. This X-shaped building up here, that's what's called the secure housing unit, or abbreviated the SHU. So that's where the solitary confinement cells are for Pelican Bay. So I picked Pelican Bay, one, because it's easy to find pictures of, and two, because um, it was in the news relatively recently. Because one of the uh, main court cases, Supreme Court cases, that had to do with um, solitary confinement happened, um, it was a class action lawsuit filed by some prisoners who were in the shoe at Pelican Bay. So it's a kind of classic example of the supermax prison. So um, like I said, they're different in different states, but we do know a couple of things about how <coughs> supermax prisons look. So they're meant to be for really high security risk inmates. That's supposed to be the idea. So the cliche phrase that you hear all the time is the so-called worst of the worst, are the people who go to supermax prisons. They emphasize um, trying to separate inmates out from having a lot of interpersonal contact, both with other inmates, but also with the guards. So a pretty typical experience in a supermax prison is that an inmate will spend 23 hours a day in a single cell. So they do not have cellmates. Um, it depends on, so one of the issues that I will sort of touch on a little bit later is uh, the, the difficulty we have sometimes distinguishing life in the supermax from solitary confinement because life in the supermax oftentimes seems a lot like solitary confinement. So like I said, 23 hours a day in a single cell, no bunk mates. Um, some of the units have small windows in them. Uh, the shoe units, for example, in Pelican Bay, however, do not. So there's no sort of sense of outside time. The one hour a day that inmates don't spend in their cells is an hour that they get to spend in a recreation yard, which, by the way, is a very small sort of enclosed yard with very, very high um, concrete walls. So it's uh, typically called the dog run. That's what they will call it. So. Um, the, uh, like I said, the, um, the design of the prison is really meant to minimize human contact. So uh, the cell doors are large steel doors that have a small hole in the middle, and prisoners are fed through the tray, um, through the uh, hole in the middle with a tray of sort of, um, so the guards are sort of, again, you can only really see their hands. 
um, when, you, uh, when they receive their meals. And again, they don't have any contact with other prisoners, any other, especially no um, people in the shoe, for example. So just to give you a quick sense of what that's like. So interior photos. Um, this is a kind of typical Supermax unit. In this one, you can obviously see the small window here in the back. Um, one of the, you can't quite see in this photo, but this is actually pretty typical of the cell. So the bed here, the bunk, is actually attached to the wall. This one is a steel bunk. Um, some of the bunks are actually also made of the same poured concrete that the floors and the ceiling and the walls are made out of. And what you don't see in this photo is actually, um, I thought it was going to show up and it didn't. The, uh, there's a, a toilet and sink combination here in the corner. So the toilet bowl, if you can imagine that, is sort of right here and then up along the wall right here where the tank would be of the toilet, there's actually a sink that's right there. So there are some shoe units, um, Supermax units, where inmates can have things like televisions in the bunk, but that's not true of Pelican Bay. That's not true of a lot of um, solitary units. Usually there's, no, there's nothing in there except for sort of very basic minimal things. Sometimes um, inmates are allowed things like pen and paper, stuff like that, but mostly not. Um, the shoe units in Pelican Bay, for example, are 8 by 10. There's some variation in how big the cells are. So there's a women's prison, for example, where they're actually a little bit smaller. Um, so uh, again, that's part of the problem of knowing what uh, information we have is that it's really difficult to collect. Uh, there's a lot of state variance in terms of what's, uh, what people can report, what states keep records of. So it's a little bit difficult to, um, to get a lot of that information, but that's, that's sort of the typical picture of the cell. Again, like I said, in the shoe um, in Pelican Bay, there's no window, actually. Again, reiterating the point that it's hard to get information, um, Solitary Watch, which is a watchdog group and a nonprofit organization that tries to keep tabs on solitary in the US, uh, estimates that there are between 80,000 and 100,000 people who are in solitary confinement. But again, because of the variation in data and reporting, it's actually really hard to get an estimate for how many people. Um, OK, a little bit more into the philosophy now at this point. So there are a lot of human rights organizations, legal scholars, moral philosophers, activists of various kinds who are pretty convinced that solitary confinement is cruel and unusual punishment and it violates the Eighth Amendment for that reason. Um, ACLU, for example, Human Rights Watch, for example, both of those uh, organizations have declared that solitary confinement is a human rights violation. So there is some, I think, widespread agreement that there's something wrong with solitary confinement. Something about this seems bad. Um, the trouble is, when it comes to the legal stuff, courts have actually been quite resistant to declare solitary confinement an actual human rights violation. There have been court cases about this. Um, the uh, most recent one, Ashker v. Brown or Ashker v. Governor California, again, this was the one that was brought, the class action lawsuit that was brought against um, from the, the prisoners in Pelican Bay, it ended up placing restrictions on the SHU units, incarceration in the SHU units. So essentially what that did, what Ashka v. Brown did, was say anyone who was in the SHU at Pelican Bay for over 10 years had to be moved back into the general population. So it was a settlement, by the way. Had to be moved back into the general population. Um, the SHU unit terms could not be indefinite. So nobody could be sentenced to the SHU for an indefinite amount of time. And then um, there had to be some sort of appeals process instituted where if you were sent to the shoe, you had some way of appealing that sentence and being able to get, try to get yourself back into the general population because prior to Ashkerby Brown, they were not those um, safeguards that were in place. So even then, Ashkerby Brown didn't declare solitary confinement on the whole an Eighth Amendment violation. It merely placed restrictions on them. So, Let's talk a little bit about why there are some difficulties about solitary confinement. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal difficulties, and then I'll talk a little bit about just sort of what are the challenges we face in trying to really explain what's wrong with solitary confinement. So the Eighth Amendment, um, legal scholars and courts typically use a kind of two-step process for trying to figure out whether or not something is a violation of the Eighth Amendment. So the first step is whatever you're weighing in on, actions or conditions, have to be incredibly severe, severely harmful. 
Okay. The second prong is that prison officials have to show what's called deliberative indifference. Courts, legal scholars have admitted that there are issues with both of these tests when it comes to solitary confinement. So with regard to the second one, for example, um, it's hard to actually show that prisoners, that, excuse me, that prison officials really have shown deliberative indifference just by putting someone in solitary confinement. Why? Well, they still meet some basic minimum of care, for example. So uh, prisoners are fed. They are allowed recreation. They, are, they have access to basic medical care. Now, of course, legal scholars, philosophers, human rights activists have all made the case that all of these things are woefully inadequate, right? Um, it's inadequate medical care. This is inadequate to have somebody just having a you know, one hour recreation period. Um, all of these things are sort of bare minimum. But from the court's perspective, from legal scholars' perspective, well, at the very least, that shows that there's not deliberative indifference, because if there were deliberative indifference, then you wouldn't have even those basic minimum things, right? When it comes to the first standard, um, harms and things like that, well, yeah, so uh, it's difficult for prison officials, for example, to draw a line between someone suffering a sort of psychological, bad psychological effects from being in the shoe versus someone who's just like, let's say, acting out, right? Because some of those things actually kind of look the same. So somebody who might be having deep kind of psychological problems in the shoe might do something like um, take their extra food from lunch and, and uh, flush it down their toilet so they can flood their cell, which is kind of a common thing that people in solitary confinement do. Uh, so from the prison official's perspective, it's hard to tell whether or not that person's suffering psychological damage or whether or not that person is actually doing something just to sort of act out so that they'll get out of their cells. Um, again, you may not agree that that's a really um, a salient problem, but that, that seems to be at least one of the issues that the courts are particularly sensitive to and that legal scholars are sensitive to. So there are difficulties with really showing um, fully Eighth Amendment a violation. Also, when it comes to the moral arguments, again, now we're sort of switching into this question about what is it exactly that makes solitary confinement wrong? Why is it morally wrong, per se? So one of the problems is when you're making arguments about why solitary confinement is wrong, the vast majority of people don't want to then also make arguments that apply to imprisonment generally. Now, you could do that. You could be um, an incarceration abolitionist, and you could say, I don't want people to be incarcerated at all. And that would be fine. You could also make those arguments. But a lot of people don't want to really want to say that. They just want to say, there's something really wrong with solitary that's not necessarily wrong with imprisonment. A lot of opponents will point out, well, but look, imprisonment and solitary are kind of the same sort of thing. They're just different in degree. So people in solitary, for example, are, def are deprived of more stuff than people who are in, uh, just regularly incarcerated, but they're deprived of the same sort of thing, right? Human contact, again, less of it, but um, inmates are also, you know, regular inmates are also um, deprived of human contact in various ways. Um, the, once you get into sort of the supermax issue, it's actually kind of difficult to uh, distinguish what's going on in the supermax prison from what's going on in solitary confinement, because a lot of those incredibly restrictive measures start to look a lot like solitary confinement. So some of the arguments have difficulty just trying to figure out what's sort of uniquely bad about solitary confinement that's not necessarily uniquely bad against, um, about imprisonment. Although again, you might want to just argue against both of those things. That's fine. I uh, take it there's, uh, but a lot of people don't actually want to do that. They just want to argue against solitary confinement. This argument comes up mostly in the context of prison officials. So a lot of prison officials will say, look, when people are already incarcerated, we still need some sort of disciplinary measures for people who do things that break the rules that are part of incarceration. What are we supposed to do besides segregate those prisoners in further isolation? That seems like it's the only option that we have. So from within prison officials and sort of that world, they'll say, look, we still need disciplinary standards. Um, solitary confinement is kind of the thing that we go to when we have a prisoner that can't be kept in general population. If we get rid of solitary confinement, what other options do we have, right? Um, it seems like there need to be some sort of disciplinary standards. Okay, so those are some of the difficulties. There are probably more. Um, like I said, there are, you, you, you can you know, fight with me that these are not particularly interesting worries, that's okay. Um, but these usually are the, the kind of worries that you hear when you're talking about you know, what is uniquely wrong with solitary confinement. So enter my paper, 
as hopefully a possible solution. What I'm interested in is trying to figure out what, is, what makes solitary confinement so bad. What is it precisely that we don't like? I mean, on the one hand, that sounds really obvious to say. It sounds really obvious to say, well, look, locking somebody in a tiny little cell for 23 hours a day with no access to sunlight or other human contact is really terrible. Yes, agreed, really terrible. The question is how, right? How exactly is it terrible? Why is it terrible, uniquely terrible, in a way that imprisonment is not, or, you know, again, maybe you want to argue imprisonment's also terrible, but um, in a way that sort of being part of the general population in inmates is not uniquely terrible. I like to think a Kantian framework can help illuminate that. So that's what I'm going to propose. I'm going to say that Kant, using Kant as a lens can help us figure out what's uniquely wrong about solitary confinement. Now, you might initially start thinking, especially if you know a little bit about Kant, you might start thinking, I don't know if he's the guy to go to when it comes to this kind of stuff. You know, he's kind of a giant retributivist. Yeah, so I'm not one of those people who argues that Kant's not a retributivist. I totally think Kant's a retributivist. Um, retributivism doesn't exactly have a great reputation of being like soft on crime, right? Not really, like that's not really their thing, you know? Um, so you might think, I don't know, he, he has some pretty serious retributive com commitments. If you could show that solitary confinement was properly retributive, uh, wouldn't he be fine with it? Wouldn't that be okay? Wouldn't that be consistent on a Kantian position? <laughs> Worse, Kant approves of things like the death penalty. Totally does. Again, there are some Kantians who think, no, not done. And I'm like, yeah, he kind of is. Like, he kind of says that really explicitly. So, yeah, he is okay with the death penalty. Um, he's also pretty okay with things like convict labor. So, again, Kant, not a guy who you would think is particularly sympathetic to people who are incarcerated. So he's kind of a, you know, hardcore punishment person. So you would think, I don't know, again, these seem like pretty harsh things. Why is he not okay with this other really harsh thing? It gets even worse for me. I'm showing you all the weaknesses at the beginning. Um, he even writes that a person of high standing given to violence could be condemned to undergo a solitary confinement involving hardship. Ooh, that looks bad for me. Why am I even here, right? <laughs> that looks really bad uh, when he explicitly says that solitary confinement's okay. So I have what they like to call a hard row to hoe here <laughs> in uh, trying to convince you that Kant's not in favor of this. So let me, let me point out some other stuff that might make you feel a little bit better. Um, one of the big tenets of Kantian theory, particularly when it comes to punishment, is that at the very least we know when people commit crimes, they do not, as Kant will put it, lose their innate personality. They only lose what he calls their civil personality. That means they're still moral persons even if they are criminals. And because that is the case, there are certain kinds of limits that we place on uh, what we can and cannot do to criminals. So, for example, one of the things that he rules out in the metaphysics of morals is medical experiments on prisoners. That's not an okay thing to do because you can't use people as a means in that way. So that's one thing. Um, one of the other things he says is that punishment, there are certain punishments that, as he'll put it, dishonor humanity itself. Now, he goes for the really gruesome examples in these cases. The gruesome examples are um, having a prisoner's ears and nose cut off, uh, having them drawn and quartered, and having them torn apart by dogs. All of those things, not okay on Kant's view. So there are limits is what I'm saying. Look, there are limits. Uh, you might think those are not great limits, but they're limits nonetheless. So my question is, for the consistent Kantian position, does solitary confinement fall inside or outside of those limits? Right? So that's, I'm going to try to argue that actually solitary confinement falls outside of those limits. We'll see how that goes. So I'm going to tell you what my proposal is, and then I'm going to defend it. I think Kant and Kantians should reject solitary confinement as offensive to human dignity. I think that's true. I think the way we're going to argue that is that solitary confinement undermines a human being's ability to reason, and as such, her agency. Right? Um, we know for Kant that reason is a sort of central piece of moral agency. That's one of the things that defines your moral agency. And so anything that sort of undermines, this is in part my proposal, right? Anything that undermines your ability to reason undermines your moral agency as well. 
I think we're going to reach that conclusion maybe from a slightly different place than you might be expecting it. So uh, you expect it for sure in the moral philosophy. I actually think we get a lot of help if we go to other places where Kant talks about what, what Lawrence Pasternak calls his normative epistemology and also his anthropology. I think if we go to those other places, we can fill in the story a little bit better about precisely what is the matter with solitary confinement. So that's what I'm going to try to do. So that's the proposal that I have for you. OK. Right up the road from us is good old Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. So before I get into the Kant stuff, I want to talk a little bit about the role that isolation is supposed to play here in solitary confinement. So interior of a cell from good old Eastern State Penitentiary. Um, isolation has been a part of uh, prison um, and prison life ever since the uh, prison reforms in the 19th century. So that, um, the prison reforms in the 19th century sort of made isolation a kind of central feature of prison. So this is obviously a modern picture of uh, Eastern State Penitentiary. Um, what you can see here, up here, is this little tiny sliver of light. This little tiny sliver of light is coming from a little tiny window that's up at the top of the cell. So this is the dimensions of the cell are the same. Obviously, this furniture is all decayed now. Um, but you might think to yourself, why did they put a window in the top of the cell as opposed to on the walls of the cell? Well, that was intentional. Um, the windows in Eastern State Penitentiary are referred to as the eyes of God. Uh, this is from Peter Scharf Smith, who's done a history of um, the prison reform in the 19th century. And he says, the inmate was expected to turn his thoughts inward, to meet God, to repent his crimes, and to return to society as a morally cleansed Christian citizen. Right? So the idea was supposed to be that solitude, being in solitude, helps you reform your character because it forces you into reflection. Right? Um, and then the, the skylights are supposed to be sort of the um, symbolic of the ever watchful eye of God, right? And looking into your heart and looking at your character. Uh, yeah, but we've had doubts about that even, again, in the 19th century, right? So it, it's not as though everybody sort of thought this was a great idea. There were a lot of people who didn't. So one of them, for example, was one Charles Dickens. Um, which you might remember, uh, Dickens goes on an uh, American tour in 1849, and uh, he tours Eastern State Penitentiary, actually. He goes to Philadelphia, and he visits Eastern State, and um, he details that in American notes and talks about the prisoners that he meets and talks about the prisoners that he interviews there, and he comes to this conclusion. I hold this slow and daily tampering with the mysteries of the brain to be immeasurably worse <coughs> than any torture of the human body. So Dickens minces no words about any of this. Um, he leads you through this incredibly painful thought experiment in American Notes where he tr asks you to imagine yourself being plunked down in one of the cells in Eastern State Penitentiary and asks you to imagine spending minute after minute, day after day, year after year in that cell. What kind of person would you become right, if that was true of you? And Dickens thinks, of course, you could never say with any certainty that you wouldn't become just like one of the prisoners that he meets in, in uh, Philadelphia in Eastern State Penitentiary. So there have been doubts about that from the get-go. I actually want to claim, probably <coughs> to some people's surprise, I might imagine, that Kant is more in line with Dickens than he is with the people that Peter Scharf Smith describes. So I think Kant thinks we should not Think in isolation and solitude. That may sound not Kantian, because he kind of gets the reputation of being a, one of those natural light of reason guys. Right? Um, he kind of makes a big deal out of reason, kind of makes a big deal out of thinking. You would think, I don't know, I mean, isn't he OK with thinking in solitude? Isn't that, I mean, aren't you supposed to think it for yourself? Isn't that supposed to be part of the project of enlightenment, after all? Uh, yeah, but. What I'm going to do now, and I apologize to the non-Kantians in the room, we're going to have to get into the text. Sorry. I know. I know. It's all right. This is the passages on your handout. But I want to make sure that you, you realize that you see my interpretation is not totally off the rails here. So I'm going to go through a couple of different pieces of textual evidence to try to show you that, in <coughs> fact, Kant is, again, more like Dickens than he is like Peter Scharf Smith's characters. So let's start with the orientation essay. So the passages that I have for the orientation essay are um, uh, passage five. We'll start there. So 
Kant's anticipating this possible point that people make. He says, of course it's said that the freedom to speak and to write could be taken from us by a superior power, but the freedom to think cannot be. That's a common thing people say, Kant will say. It's a common objection people make. Kant responds, Kant doesn't buy this. He says, yet, yet how much and how correctly would we think if we did not think, as it were, in community with others to whom we communicate our thoughts and who communicate theirs with us? Thus, one can very well say that this external power, which wrenches away people's freedom to publicly communicate their thoughts, also takes from them the freedom to think. So Kant doesn't buy the objection, the idea, that you would still have the freedom to think if you didn't have the freedom to speak and you didn't have the freedom to write. Um, how much and how well, he says, would you think if you didn't have those things? And his answer seems to be not much and not well. You need communication with other people. That's why freedom of the press is so incredibly important for Kant, right? Uh, because we need other people to test our thoughts against, and we need to think with others in order to think well. Not just in the orientation that he says that. The orientation essay also contains a lot of discussion about how reason finds its compass. Kant loves navigational metaphors. He uses them all over the place. And orientation essay is no different. But you see that same theme in other places. You see this theme in two different related ideas. The census communis, which you find in the anthropology and in the critique of judgment, and also the logical egoist, who's related to the census communis. So let's we'll start with the census communis and try to get a sense of what that is. So um, passage one. Four, the census communis is a subjectively necessary touchstone of the correctness of our judgments generally and consequently for the soundness of our understanding, that we also restrain our judgment, excuse me, our understanding by the understanding of others, instead of isolating ourselves with our own understanding and judging publicly with our, excuse me, with our private representation, so to speak. So the census communis literally translates into common sense, but not common sense in the kind of classic way where people will say, oh, you darn philosophers, you don't have any common sense. Not that. So common sense in the sense of um, what sort of other people might be doing, what other, what human reason might also be led to do. So this is a little bit tricky because it's unclear whether or not Kant thinks we mean um, sort of real existing others because there can be a sort of a danger in that. I think he does mean that. There can be these dangers that he warns us against and we can talk about that in Q&A. Um, but I do think he means um, the other possibilities that other humans could come up with when you're reasoning. So you test, right? It's a touchstone. It's a subjectively necessary touchstone, as he describes it. So comparing your understanding with the understanding of others, and thus restraining your understanding by the understanding of others, we should be judging publicly rather than using our private representations, he says, to judge. OK, that's one piece. Let's look at another passage for the census communists. This is three. So by census communists, however, must be understood the idea of a communal sense, i.e., a faculty for judging, that in its reflection takes account a priori of everyone else's way of representing in thought in order, as it were, to hold its judgment up to human reason as a whole and thereby avoid the illusion which, from subjective private conditions that could easily be held to be objective, would have a detrimental influence on the judgment. Again, same kind of picture that you get. The same picture of the census communis is we're supposed to be thinking together with other people. We're supposed to be using the census communis as a kind of touchstone for our own reasoning, comparing what we're thinking to what other people are thinking so that we are led away from error. Now, what does the person look like who doesn't do this, who doesn't try to sort of reason together with others and kind of compare their reasoning with others? That's the, that person is the logical egoist. Logical egoist is a character that comes up in a couple different places for Kant. Um, he comes up in the anthropology. He comes up in the critique of pure reason. He, of course, comes up in the logic lectures. So again, a couple more passages. Sorry, we're going to get through the passages together, I promise. Um, we'll go to two and then four. So he who pays no attention at all to this touchstone, again, this is the logical egoist, but gets it into his head to recognize private sense as already valid apart from or even in opposition to common sense, is abandoned to a play of thoughts in which he sees acts and judges not in a common world, 
but rather in his own world. So the logical egoist is precisely the person who won't compare his reasoning to the census communis, doesn't think the census communis is important, doesn't think that he needs it, and that person is led astray into his own world, in private world, rather than the world with the rest of us. Same thing we see in four. The logical egoist considers it unnecessary to test his judgments, also by the understanding of others, as if he had no need for this touchstone. But it is so certain that we cannot dispense with this means of assuring ourselves of the truth of our judgments that this may be the most important reason why learned people cry out so urgently for freedom of the press. For if this freedom is denied, we are deprived at the same time of a great means of testing the correctness of our own judgments, and we are exposed to error. So again, freedom of the press is important. Why? Because we need to think together. Because we need the opportunity to communicate our thoughts, to listen to other people, to communicate their thoughts to us, because doing so is thinking well. Right? Communicating with others lets us think well. OK, I promise, almost done with the comp passages, I swear. I want to emphasize the strength of the claim, I think, that Kant's making. Kant makes some erroneous, yes, they are incorrect, erroneous judgments about whether or not people who are born deaf can reason. Yes, they are wrong. His judgments are incorrect. Of course, deaf people can reason, yes. but. Even those erroneous claims show us something interesting about the strength of the claim he's trying to make about communication. Okay, so again, a couple more passages. Six, all language is a signification of thought, and on the other hand, the best way of signifying thought is through language, the greatest instrument for understanding ourselves and others. Thinking is speaking with oneself, and consequently is also listening to oneself inwardly, to the man who is born deaf, his speaking is a feeling of the play of his lips, tongue, and jaw, and it's hardly possible to imagine that he does anything more by his speaking than carry on a play with physical feelings without having and thinking real concepts. Again, erroneous. Yes, that is incorrect. Of course, deaf people have conceptual thought. This is wrong. Kant is wrong about this. But notice what he's saying. Language is so important that it's the thing that allows us to have conceptual thoughts. Communicating with other people is what allows us to have this sort of thinking. And if we don't have that ability, we don't have the ability to hear, communicate, and talk with other people, we don't have the ability to reason. Right? He says it so strongly. I'm even not even going to read the, last, the whole thing of seven, just the last part. And people born deaf for this very reason must remain mute without speech, can never arrive at anything other than an analog of reason. Again, wrong. Yes, I know. He's wrong about that. He's wrong. It's OK. He's wrong. But the idea that he thinks that deaf people can only have an analog of reason means it's really important. Communication and language is incredibly important to thinking. Right? That's what that shows, right? So I think those claims of his are incredibly strong. I think he does think we should not, not only that we should not think in isolation, but that maybe even more strongly, we can't. We can't think in isolation. Now, I want to try to be a little bit more clear, a little bit more detailed about why. So I think there's enough textual evidence to suggest that that's the case. But I want to say a little bit more about why that's bad. Why is it bad? What's going wrong when we try to think in isolation? So what mistakes are we making? How are we getting ourselves confused? This has to do with con conception of inner sense. So quick, quick inner sense, outer sense distinction from the non-Kantians in the room. So inner sense is um, essentially your, uh, the way in which you're affected by the things that happen inside your own mind. That can be representations of various kinds. That can be the imaginings of various kinds. That can be your memory of various kinds. Um, it's an analog to outer sense. So outer sense is the way you're affected by stuff in the external world. That's all your senses, right? Taste, touch, hearing, all that kind of stuff. So inner sense is kind of the analog to that. When Kant introduces inner sense in the anthropology, the very first thing out of his mouth is, oh my goodness, inner sense is incredibly susceptible to deception and illusion. Self-deception, deception of various kinds, definitely illusion. So, so wait a minute. OK, we're incredibly susceptible to some kind of illusion or self-deception or deception <coughs> in inner sense. OK, what's that supposed to look like? There's a couple different examples he gives you. We have the tendency to accept, as he says, the play of ideas as experiential cognition. We're quite susceptible to thinking that's what's going on in our own heads is actually going on outside in the world. We're incredibly susceptible to thinking that imaginings that we have are real, right? Um, false memories are a pretty good example of this. It's pretty common for us to think that we remember something, and as it turns out, that thing never happened, or actually, no, you were never there. But it seems so clear to us in our heads 
um, when we remember it. Kant's favorite example is hypochondria. So we know Kant was really hypochondriac, like really, really, really suffered from hypochondria for a long time. Um, and so he, he uses it as an example, I think, for that reason, because he's really familiar with it. So uh, look, notice what the person with hypochondria does. The person with hypochondria either experiences some kind of physical feeling as a symptom. I have a headache, oh God, it's a brain tumor, right? That kind of thing. Um, oh my gosh, I, you know, my heart skipped a beat, I must have some kind of secret heart disease or something like this. Um, it's also the case that the hypochondriac is incredibly susceptible to outside inf like influences, right? So Kant will say, hypochondriacs love to read medical textbooks. Again, probably speaking from experience here, love to read medical textbooks, and then they find in those medical textbooks illnesses that they themselves believe they have, right? So the, the, um, this tendency to accept kind of the play of ideas and imaginings as real, as thinking that what's these sort of inner sensations turn out to be symptoms of a disease, for Kant is one of the really common illusions of inner sense. But there are more. We have a tendency to keep ourselves in what he calls an artificial frame of mind. Mostly what he has in mind here is actually the logical egoist. The person who thinks they're so smart, they don't need to compare their understanding with other people's understanding. They don't need to corroborate their thinking with anybody else's thinking either because they think somehow the thoughts of the vulgar are going to taint their reasoning or something like that. Um, Kant thinks also um, people in uh, various kinds of sort of spiritualism can be a part of this sort of, you know, having a, a very rigid sort of frame of mind. The dogmatic <laughs> metaphysicians absolutely fall into this category for sure. Um, old people, Kant thinks, who get kind of set in their ways. He uses them as an example quite a bit. Um, uh, we have a tendency to sort of get ourselves into a certain kind of mindset and we don't want to get out of it. Um, and that's a, a kind of common thing of inner sense. We sort of set these kind of little barriers for ourselves and we don't get out of them. Most importantly for Kant, the illusions that we have in inner sense can't be conveniently cleared away by rational ideas. So guess what? If you're suffering from one of the illusions of inner sense, you can't think yourself out of it. It doesn't work that way. You can't just boot your strap, bootstrap yourself out of it by thinking more. That doesn't work. In fact, the only way, as Kant's going to put it, sorry, one more passage. The only way, I'm in nine, the tendency to retire into oneself, together with the resulting illusions of inner sense, can only be set right when the human being is led back to the external world, and by means of this, to the order of things present to the outer senses. So you can't think yourself out of the illusions of inner sense, but you know what helps you? Getting back into the real world, having somebody draw you out, of you retiring to yourself, getting back in touch with the census communists and thinking together with other people helps you get out of these illusions of inner sense to which we are incredibly prone. To put it colloquially, Kant thinks we are really, really prone to get sucked up into our own heads. We just are, right? That's just a feature of who we are. Um, we, because of that, we have to orient our thinking. We need a compass. We need things to anchor us. And the census communis is one of those things, right? thinking together with other people about a shared world. So back to solitary confinement. This is a lovely drawing by um, a shoe, Pelican Bay shoe inmate named Michael Russell, who's done a couple of these, um, who are, uh, I think, pretty fabulous. Um, I think Kant helps us with the uh, experience in the shoe. So I'm going to start with the kind of psychological stuff that we have. And then um, I think you see that confirmed in kind of first personal accounts from people who have been in solitary confinement. So we know that solitary confinement causes a lot of psychological effects and psychological disturbances. This we know from a lot of psychology stuff. Um, I'm just citing Glancy and Murray as one example. Excuse me, one example here. Now, um, it is true that a great deal of people who are put in solitary confinement often suffer already from mental illnesses. That's, that happens quite a bit. However, it is also the case that people who are put in solitary confinement who have no history of mental illness can also suffer these exact same sort of side effects. So it's not just people who have a history of mental illness. Very common visual and auditory hallucinations. So people will see things, hear things, see people. They'll, they'll describe the walls and the doors as moving in various ways. They'll describe these sort of odd psychedelic patterns that they'll see on the walls. 
they have um, impaired memory and cognitive function, um, being able to pay attention becomes incredibly difficult for them. Um, they have a lot of difficulty remembering. Obviously, the people who suffer, um, who, who are in the shoes, who have um, no access to sunlight, have an incredibly difficult time telling what time it is. And they have to learn how to tell time without clocks and without sort of any sense of daylight. And so they start being able to tell time by things like meals and stuff like that, bed, you know, in, when they have the, uh, the particular sort of events in their day. Affective disturbances are incredibly common, so um, really violent mood swings, um, serious problems with impulse control. It's incredibly common, for example, for people in shoes to, um, like I said, uh, stuff their food down the toilet um, and try to flood their cells. They will oftentimes um, take their bed sheets and rip them up into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. They'll do things like collect feces and urine and then throw it on the guards when the guards come through to deliver their meals. Again, this is, again, from people who have no history of mental illness will still do things like this. When they get out of the shoe, oftentimes they'll think back and be rather surprised at themselves for doing these kinds of things. Again, more um, art from uh, people who are in uh, shoes. This is from Ernest Jerome de France, who's in Mule Creek State Prison at um, California. It's a pen drawing, and it doesn't super show up, but I don't know if you can tell, but there's this very small little figure here um, in the middle of this incredibly dark sort of pen, um, pen circle. This is all confirmed in first-person narratives. So one of the famous first-person narratives is by Jack Henry Abbott. Um, who wrote a book called The Belly and the Beast, who talks about being um, in the belly of the beast, who talks about being incarcerated, but he talks also about being what he calls in the hole. And so the way he'll, he's incredibly articulate about it, um, the way he puts it is, your sense perception having taken in everything, including yourself within the finite confines of the hole, now passes through the monotony and rises up from the other side, the infinite to haunt you with reality. So he talks about being in solitary confinement as suffering a kind of strange inversion of self. Um, and the way in which his sense perception kind of turns around on itself and kind of rises up, as he says, in reality, to haunt you in reality. Um, these are from some uh, interviews uh, quoted in uh, uh, Lorna Rhodes' um, uh, work on solitary confinement. So again, common things you'll say, um, I see things that's on the wall. Uh, I know there's no explanation for it. I know it might be a fig figment of my imagination, but I don't know. Uh, sometimes I see faces coming past my window when I'm lying on my bed. Sometimes I see things on the wall. Sometimes I hear voices. Again, really common. Um, again, in a, a different interview in Rhodes, um, my speech, my talk, my voice, it's all changed. So people have trouble formulating sentences who have been in SHU for a long time. And in fact, this is not just true of people who have been in secure housing units, but it's also true of people who have been kept in isolation independently, not, not incarcerated. So prisoners of war, for example, actually have exactly many of the same kinds of experiences that people in the SHU will have. Um, they have a great amount of difficulty following conversations, even when they have to meet with their lawyers, for example. They start being unable to actually know what people are saying. Right? I think Khan would be zero surprised if you showed him all of this stuff about the things that are happening in the SHU and in solitary confinement. Um, why do I think that? Because in that form of deep isolation, we're deprived precisely of the anchors that we need to think well. Uh, we're deprived of the census communists, we're deprived of communications with others, and deprived of those anchors because we have uh, this incredible ability to suffer the illusions and deceptions of inner sense. Those things easily arise and they easily take over because what helps us astray from these things is being in communication with others about the external world, right? Having some kind of anchor. Um, I think what's going on is that Reason is essentially trying, so for Kant, reason is an act of power. Reason's trying to manufacture, if you're in isolation, deep isolation, it's trying to manufacture the compass that it's looking for. It, it wants the census communists, it can't find the census communists, it wants some sort of orientation, it can't find that orientation, and so it ends up basically trying to manufacture what it can't have. So you need somebody to talk to, you invent them. Um, one of the things that Kant will say about inner sense is that it deeply relies on things like contrast, change, and novelty. It's precisely what you do not have in deep forms of isolation. You have monotony, as Jack Henry Abbott will put it, over and over and over again. So you have nothing to sort of keep 
inner sense kind of going. And so you end up trying very hard to anchor yourselves, but you can't you anchor yourself, but there's nothing for you to anchor yourself with. And so you end up trying to manufacture all this stuff. People in isolation will lose the ability to think, talk, and distinguish basically between appearance and reality, between the imaginings and what's real, because they don't have anything that's kind of keeping them grounded in these ways right? that Kant thinks are important. I think that can tell us something about what's particularly wrong about solitary confinement. So again, more art by Michael Russell. This is called Shoe Syndrome. So we know the regular Kantian story. The regular Kantian story is that reason is constitutive of moral agency. Anything that's an attack on reason is an attack on moral agency. OK, done deal. No, not really. There's more we can say, I think. Um, look, solitary confinement does worse than that. It causes reason to turn on itself. Reasons, like I said, it's an act of power. And it's intentionally it's sort of going through these kind of grounding exercises, I think, continually. And um, what it makes, what force, this kind of isolation sort of forces people into the situation where their reason starts to become its own undoing, looking for and doing its regular activity that it's normally trying to do, namely reach out, corroborate, think together with others, ends up being its own undoing. So its continuous attempt to orient itself basically causes its further deterioration. So solitary confinement turns somebody against themselves. Right? And I think that's what we think of as particularly bad, particularly terrible about solitary confinement. Right? They're forced in this position where they have to sort of they unravel their own agency. They do it to themselves, basically. That, I think, is really what's the kind of at the core of what's really, really horrible about solitary confinement. Right? So I'm at 45 minutes, which so I can stop there. I, got a, I have another slide of some more Kant stuff, but I can do that in Q&A if, if that's OK. Okay. Yeah, that's probably good. To okay. About 25 totally fine. Yeah, yeah, let's right, do that. So Thank you. Who has questions? Yeah, let's start with. All right. So, uh, my name is Jacob. I liked your talk. Hey, Jacob. I, Thank I, you. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of solitary confinement. I'm not a fan of imprisonment in general. But right. it seems like the points you're making would apply to solitude in general and not just solitary confinement. Like, yeah. Like if if Rowan were a prison, an asylum, I, it's hard to imagine, I know. But and, and this guy, <laughs> this guy over here comes in and he yeah. does some like reprehensible right. stuff, like mm -hmm. stuff you can't even describe, mm -hmm. right? And all of us collectively decide, mm -hmm. being the solitary confinement has been abolished, right. we all collectively decide we're not going to associate with this guy. Mm -hmm. Now, all of the points on the psychological trauma and and robbing moral agency and all that stuff that would still apply. So, would Kant say that? us dissociating from this man would be impermissible? Good. So I, I don't, thank you for the question. I don't, I don't think so. So you're right in that a lot of the criticisms that Kant's making here capture not just solitary confinement, but solitude in general. And yeah, in a way, at a certain point, I think he's wedded to that. I think he wants to say it is bad for you to be in deep kinds of isolation and deep kinds of solitude even if it's not confinement in this way. It's bad for you to do that self-selectively. It's bad for you to withdraw and to not want to think together with others because you get yourself into all kinds of trouble and there's literally no way you can sort of lead yourself out of the desert of your own mind if you do that sort of stuff. So yeah, now that's, for him I think that's a, um, a claim that's going to be tempered in a, in a few ways. So I don't think he's going to have any problem with you know, a certain measure of solitude, right? And he certainly thinks there, so, so the tension he's working with here is thinking together with others, I think he believes is necessary for thinking well, but he also is kind of wary of people being influenced really deeply by sort of habit, custom, what's done in society. That kind of stuff is a danger to independent thinking also, just like being too much in solitude is also a danger. So those are sort of a Scylla and Charybdis we kind of have to navigate if we're good Kantian thinkers. And I think, I don't know that he has a sort of easy way of us navigating those things. So he's going to be okay with some isolation. Now that doesn't answer your question about what do we do if Professor Bauer is a terrible person and we don't want to associate it with him anymore. Um, so Kant does think it's okay for us to, now we're sort of switching into kind of moral stuff, right? Um, less so about just the epistemology stuff. Um, 
Kant does think it's okay for us to distance ourselves from people who are just really, really terrible. Um, we do have that option because we do have um, what I'm going to call, or what I have called in other stuff, um, a, a moral self-defense. We're allowed to sort of defend ourselves and not have to engage constantly with somebody who, for example, berates and belittles and does terrible things yeah. to us. Yeah, so that's okay. So um, I think the way he's going to get around that is that that's provisional. So that withdrawal is provisional on Professor Bauer changing his ways and becoming a better person. So he always has a re-entry into the community. So the solitude would be provisional in that sense. Um, yeah, I think that's what he's going to try to say. Okay. I think, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I, I sort of wanted to follow up on that a little yeah, bit, yeah. actually, because I, I was trying to think of sort of, yeah, you know, some of the positive benefits of isolation. Of mm -hmm. course, Kant's famous for mm -hmm. his silent decade and withdrawing from the scholarly community to right. some extent, right? Yeah, yeah. So he could work this out on his own. Right. Uh, but, I mean, you, I think you have a good response to sort of how to deal with that. The, the other example I was trying to think of was, like, certain extreme forms of monastic life. Yeah. Uh, where they take on a, a vow of silence and you yeah. might not communicate for years. Yeah. And it doesn't, as far as I know, it doesn't seem to have the same sort of, uh, uh, harm, cause the same sort of harm to the people right. involved. Right. And so it, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on what would be different in, in those scenarios. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so one thing, and it gets himself, I think, in trouble a little bit with people who are of the more monastic um, persuasion. Because he does, he seems not to be a huge fan of that, right? I mean, he sort of says like, ah, no, um, you get yourself into huge trouble and probably think you can hear the voice of God and that's probably false and you probably can't, right? I mean, he's sort of, is not, um, and he's, yeah, that he, I think he might be even, maybe he's a little too dismissive um, in those ways, but he is particularly concerned about that. Um, yeah, so they don't have the same sort of deleterious effects, but even if they don't have the same sort of psychological Forms. I think Kant still thinks there's no, um, we're sort of venturing out as to use one of his navigational metaphors again into the shoreless ocean, right? So even in the monastic life, even if you come out of it on the other side, sort of feeling great, feeling in touch with God, something like that, um, I think for Kant it might just be because you're lucky. Um, and maybe, now there's also another thread of this where, you know, Kant is a kind of look like, like let's not get it twisted, right? He's a kind of you know, pull yourself together guy, right? He's a kind of like, you need to have strength of mind and you need to get yourself in order. So it could very well be the case that having a certain kind of strength of mind helps with that kind of stuff. And maybe the religious contemplation that goes on with the monastic life helps maybe function as a kind of anchor. I think he might be a little wary of that. So I might be straying too far from him, but it could very well be that that kind of religious contemplation gives you enough structure to be able to sort of keep yourself in check. That's and, possible. And they also have practices, like like it's culturally, it's it's structured in a very right. careful way, presumably, that's to, right. to probably to prevent some of these things. That's right, right. rituals yeah. and that kind of yeah. thing. I think that's right. Well, too. Certainly, I would add it's also, you also have a lot of communal sensory experience, even, even in right? You're taking a balance yeah, that's true. doesn't mean you never yeah. encounter right. other people, you never interact with other people, right. you never, you never see other people move right. around with other people because yeah. um, I think part of the phenomenological stuff that fits into this and this is I guess the next thing I wanted to ask you mm -hmm. about, yeah. I'm, I'm going to take my question here okay. since, since it's, it's going is you know, it's not just talking right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a kind of holy sensory sort of relation to okay. the world and the way in which even non-verbally you know, and I'm, part, I'm actually partly thinking, I'm thinking of Toulouse has an essay in Michel Tournier's novel called um, Vendredi um, Friday, which is, is a sort of a rewrite of Robinson Crusoe, but, but the, the underlying thing is the idea that he's really interested in of, of what happens when you're, when you're alone and you don't have other people to corroborate your experience of the world, even just in terms of behavioral responses and right. things like mm -hmm. this. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking that there's another dimension to this besides the verbal and the linguistic dimension in terms of the way in which some sort of loss of, of a kind of sense of reality or ability to process or deal with it might occur that mm -hmm. it's maybe worth tacking on to Kant. Yeah. Um, that's the first thing. The other thing I wanted to ask, though, is I want to ask you a little bit about the slippery slope question of, okay. <laughs> right, of, of solitary versus 
versus in prison more generally, yes, yeah. versus these kinds of restrictions more generally. Right. Because one of the things that we also know from a lot of people who, who've been imprisoned is that the regimes of imprisonment seem to do a lot of the things that you're attributing to solitary confinement to right. people, maybe to a somewhat lesser degree, but the, mm -hmm. the degree of, of active psychological harm that is produced to, let's call it, moral agency right. by being placed in this situation and kept mm -hmm. there for a very long period of time is real, mm -hmm. right? Yes. I mean, it's pretty yeah, well yeah. established. Very so, mm -hmm. so while I understand that you're trying really hard to sort of, you know, to sort of, like, create that distinction between mm -hmm. solitary confinement is a particularly morally repugnant thing right. and imprisonment, I, I wonder, though... I mean, and I get, I get that it, it appeals to people who, you know, it's just it's incremental and there's a mm -hmm. bunch of reasons to do this, but, but I guess I want to, I want to push you on that. Yeah, like, that's totally that. fine. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> let me, so let me take the first, the, the first question just because I think, yes. So I, so yeah, I don't know how much of that I agree. I don't, there's mm, the textual evidence for Kant's a little thin on the sort of nonverbal stuff, right. but he does have it. So he'll say, for example, um, it's not just that we need to talk to each other, it's that we sometimes don't even quite know what we're sensing right. unless we have access to other people. So he, he puts it in terms of a conversation where you know you, you think you hear a bell and you say, wait, did I just hear a bell or did somebody else hear a bell, right? And, but he thinks we still do that even with regard to our sense experience. Right. So we do have that same kind of, so I think there's enough, there's enough room to say, yeah, he's gonna be comfortable with that extension too. Right. Yeah, so for sure. So, so uh, cards on the table, I'm okay with these arguments capturing at least some things about prison also, right? I'm actually okay with the idea that, yeah, maybe, uh, again, on Kantian terms here, if it turns out that uh, regular incarceration ends up doing some of these same things, all the more reason for us to be critical of and rethink mm -hmm. what we're doing in regular incarceration. I don't think the arguments get us to abolition, um, I don't know if I, I'm, I don't have views about whether or not I'm a prison abolitionist, I'm not quite sure, um, but I do think we could radically reimagine incarceration in ways that would help mitigate some of these worries. So I'm actually okay with there being a little bit, with it encroaching onto that territory. I do want to pitch it for, um, for people who think that there is something sort of specially wrong about solitary right. confinement. And so I, so I pitch it there, but I'm, I'm actually pretty comfortable with the extension that, yeah, these same kinds of things can be said of regular incarceration as well. Um, and that that's, and all the more reason to cr be critical of those kinds of practices, yeah. yeah. Cool. So to push the abolitionist line even mm -hmm. further, mm -hmm. It seems, in, insofar as we have this discipline problem where you have to do something that constitutes a punishment from the perspective of somebody who's already been imprisoned, it seems kind of natural to say that if I'm going to maintain the institution in anything at all like the form it is in which I keep people incarcerated as a punishment, and I just have to maintain something that's institution where I just hold them punished for long periods of time, mm -hmm. that I'll have to have either solitary confinement or something comparably bad as a central feature of this institution as the only thing holding it together. Right. And insofar as I could say, okay, maybe I could do a moderate acceptable retribution onto these like effects mm -hmm. of their reason and that they might actually need mm -hmm. some restructuring in order to become like proper moral citizens. Right. I could say insofar as this institution has to exist for long periods of time, mm -hmm. I have to do horrible things to keep it together that would never under any mm -hmm. circumstance be acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, let, me try, let me try this and let me see if it gets at your question. So, so while I'm sensitive to the claims from, for example, prison officials who will say, look, we've got to do something right, with people who can't be a part of general population. Um, okay, even if you concede that, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to keep these people totally deprived of all human contact for an indeterminate period of time, well, right? Well, my question doesn't necessarily entail oh, okay. solitary confinement, but I have to do something comparably bad. I can't get away with doing anything of a significantly lesser degree that mm -hmm. will still hit hard enough to keep the institution in order. Um, well, I mean, I, the, the, I'm not sure... 
So, okay, so I'm not sure that actually the retributivist sort of model is kind of what's operative in that concern that people have, at least in the one that was on my handout. So, in, in that, by that I mean mostly what that worry is is a kind of, it's not so much like, well, we have to punish these people because they're even extra worse or like extra bad, and so we have to punish them extra. But rather, solitary confinement is a kind of, it's a logistical, it solves a logistical problem that we have that we yeah, can't. So the question is saying, like, okay, insofar as we need it to solve the logistical problem, right. but it isn't justified, we couldn't actually do this to people on the grounds of proper retribution. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't say these people deserve it because they're wrong. Right. But I end up having to do it to them anyway to keep the institution alive, that I've overstepped the bounds in building an institution that requires that. Right. And so I think the answer to that is you can segregate people from general population without putting them into solitary confinement. So you can remove them from gen pop. And yeah, that's going to require them to be at least have less human contact than they in fact do. But that doesn't mean that you have no human contact. So again, I, this, is, this would have to be a reimagining. So you would have to be, give them um, opportunities to talk to other people, for example. Counselors, I think, would probably be helpful. Um, but you could segregate a prisoner, it seems to me, without sort of keeping them 23 hours a day with no sunlight. I mean, that seems like, it seems like there's, a, a, there's some other things we could do if we just kind of reimagine what is possible in terms of segregation that's not that kind of solitary confinement. So again, I'm, I, this is kind of pie in the sky in a way, or really reimagining how this would go. But I imagine you could say, I mean, take, let's suppose, I mean, so Timothy McVeigh, for example, is in one of the supermax prisons. Let's imagine that he really is somebody who can't possibly be put in Gen Pop because he just is really that far off. I, mean, I don't know that that's true of Timothy McVeigh, but let's suppose that it is, right? Imagine that he really is that kind of person. I still think there are ways that you could segregate him from general population without sticking him in a box for 23 hours a day with no sunlight, right? That seems like, it seems like there's some space in between being with other prisoners and being with no one forever. That seems like there's other stuff we could do in between there I that wouldn't I was, reach the. I think it's less like McVeigh, where you have somebody like, okay, this person is so fundamentally flawed that they couldn't be placed in it, and more in the way in which solitary confinement is used to maintain discipline. So I get a whole bunch of people who are standard offenders, mm -hmm. and insofar as they act out in the prison, and I need to keep the prison under control, right. I have to punish them somehow. Right. And insofar as this is already the maximum level of punishment mm -hmm. I could say they deserve, mm -hmm. I couldn't morally say even worse punishments, mm -hmm. but I need them to keep the prison alive. I, yeah, I still want to say there are other things you can do. Again, we just have to radically reimagine what those things will be. There are other things you can do besides solitary confinement, even if, so I don't know that solitary confinement is necessary to maintain the control. I think you could do other things. Again, it would be, I, what those things are right off the top of my head, I don't know, but it does seem to me if we sat down and really thought about how we might reimagine prison discipline, we could maybe do other things, have other things available to us that wouldn't sort of force us into prison abolition as a, as a whole. Yeah, I've eaten too much okay, time. So I, I, I'm, yeah, I have to stop, Patrick. All right. I'm just going to say very quickly. Okay. Now, remember, there are two kinds of supermax. There are mm. the ones that are state supermax. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, federal. The, yes. the state supermax, nobody's ever sentenced to state supermax, right? You're sentenced to whatever, and then if you break more laws, you go up. Right. So there is that system mm -hmm. of gradation. You can be in a minimum security and start breaking, you know, one, one mm -hmm. rule after another, and then they put you in the supermax. Mm -hmm. The federal supermax is a different kind, and it's really interesting because it has no... It has a. It has one or one, uh, uh, you know, organization that looks takes over, but there's no political responsibility anywhere. Mm -hmm. Who? I mean, the 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 Bureau of Prison is really, uh, uh, and no one knows who runs it. Right. And so it is punishment. I mean, Foucault would say it's punishment by an unknown, which is what happened, right? You sanitized this punishment mm -hmm. until it became, you took it out of public into the private, mm -hmm. right? And so there are two very different systems, and the first one has this idea of, I can remove you because you're not doing, you shouldn't be in this, mm -hmm. should really punish you. The, the, and there are alternatives. Mm -hmm. You could actually, they put them initially in segregation, then they move them into the supermax eventually when, when they can't control it. Mm -hmm. But it's the federal. 
prison mm-hmm. that is problematic. Mm-hmm. And the question has now been by legal scholars is that uh, can you really um, move people out of, because it's the court that sentences you, but now in state government it's basically the Bureau of Prison that moves you. Mm-hmm. So it's easier to rule out supermax in the state system. Mm-hmm. It's more difficult in the federal system. So I just wanted to say. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> is that- is that a, was there a question or am I? No, I okay, just okay. wanted to make that clear. <laughs> okay, here, thank you. Right? Yeah. I just, because there are two different systems and they have very different, uh, people run the very different politics. Okay, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you for that. You get a question. Hi. I think, yes. Well, go ahead, we may have time for one more, but let's see how it goes. I didn't mean to take it off. No, 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 oh, no, 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 you're fine, you're fine, thank you. Um, I, I was just curious, like, so, like, I recognize that these supermax prisons are units designed for, like, long-term uh, people being held in confinement. Mm-hmm. Um, would Kant, do you think, be against if, like, temporary forms of this or maybe, like, broken up periods? Because I know you would have been saying, like, the, the tendency to retire oneself together with resulting illusions of inner sense can only be set right when the human being is led back into the external world. So if there were periods of, say, like... Um, uh, appeared within the restraints of some of those more permanent psychological damages mm-hmm. where you could say he's here for an extended period of time and then return back to this external world mm-hmm. that kind of resets these things. Mm-hmm. Would Kant be opposed to that and then more so be opposed to like the issues of the solitary confinement system rather than the idea of solitary confinement as a whole? Good question. So, um, um, hmm. he might be okay with, he might be okay with the temporary stint, provided it was definitely temporary, and provided that the person, um, the person would, it, it would have to be, it would have to be sort of context specific. So, so back in the beginning of the talk where I talked about him actually making nice things, having nice things to say for a second about solitary confinement. So he, he actually means that in a very specific context. So there he's worried about the way in which um, uh, penalties can be unequally distributed across social class. So his example is somebody who is a wealthy uh, socialite person might, if you, if you only had a fine, let's say, for verbal insults, let's suppose that's true. If you only had a fine, Kant thinks, well, you could have this sort of wealthy socialite person who had a bunch of money and could then sort of like indulge himself by insulting people from the lower class and just pay the fine and be like, oh, whatever, I don't care, I'll just pay the fine and continue to do this. That's the person he says could be forced to undergo solitary confinement. Now, why does he say that? Well, he says that because he's worried that a fine in that case in the case of the wealthy socialite, isn't properly retributive, basically. So you put somebody in solitary confinement who's the wealthy socialite, you take away something that really matters to them, which is namely their social status, right? Now, even in that case, solitary confinement is temporary. So he doesn't mean it, obviously, to be all the time. It just is a a kind of brief thing. So I think he might be okay with it in particular context. What those contexts would be... I'm not really sure, but I think he is a little bit more kind of on the Dickens line that this is something we ought to be incredibly careful with and not be sort of doling out to a whole bunch of people. So I, so I think he's going to be critical both of the practice of it as we currently see it in the U.S., but I think he's also critical of it as an idea apart from limited kinds of context, it seems to me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, so we have time for probably one more if. Hi, I uh, really like the talk. Um, Thank you. I wanted to ask concerning an extension of the census communists mm-hmm. uh, and how that would sort of a- extend to various communities. Okay. So, in society at large, when we convict a person of a crime, we are as a society saying that we are agreeing to ostracize this person, that we are agreeing to remove them from the society. Mm-hmm. Um, currently, uh, and you didn't really touch on that part of it, right. um, yeah. but assuming that we're okay with that part of you know, retributive justice, um, if we then abstract to the prison community mm-hmm. as its own society mm-hmm. with its own census communists, mm-hmm. 
could you then uh, extend that principle to uh, penalizing, I, I suppose, convicting people within that community to harsher punishments as long as it's within the uh, census communists of the prison community? Uh, mm -hmm. And if so, if the community deems it to be uh, acceptable for mm -hmm. solitary confinement to be a fitting uh, punishment for whatever that individual did, mm -hmm. would that then not be acceptable within the confines of that specific community, mm -hmm. which would have its own rules per se? Right. So, just just to make sure that I'm I wasn't sort of unclear about the the census community. So the the census community is actually not so much. Um, a community in the sense that we sometimes think of it with sort of its own values and standards and that kind of thing. The census communist for Khan is just this, um, the, the sort of collection of human reason or human reasoners that we kind of compare our understanding to and corroborate ourselves with. That can be about questions about value, but it's usually just more stuff about thinking, just kind of reasoning in general. So it's a, it functions as a kind of anchor, but it's not necessarily something like collective decision making, for example. So it's not necessarily going to be, that's not really going to be a part of the census communist. I do think Kant would say it, it would be much better if we are going to incarcerate people, we need to make sure that they are in a community with other inmates, right? That that's going to be, that yes, the community of inmates is going to function as the access that, that person needs to the sort of census community. And so meaningful interaction with other prisoners is going to be important for that person to make sure that they're thinking well. Um, uh, the, the part about justification of punishment, yeah, I didn't get into that in part because I was not initially thinking that these sort of arguments really touched on Kant's retributive commitments sort of more generally. I think these are just about sort of the, this piece about thinking, the dangers of thinking in solitude, I think just sort of like give us reason to question the practice of solitary confinement. Um, whether or not solitary confinement is you know, properly retributive and that sort of thing, even within the prison community, I'm not sure that that's a kind of collective decision making that Kant would be, I'm not sure he would be comfortable with sort of determining that via collective decision making. I think that's the laws of punishment have to be set by the state and that sort of thing for con the state considered as not individual states, but right, the nation state. Um, and that, that those rules are going to be set by them rather than the community as a whole coming up with that, with those kinds of standards. So I think he's probably going to resist that, I imagine. Yeah. So I'm going to pull it because we have time. I would like to, to first of all, thank Professor Thomason. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.